Hello and welcome to this Institute for Government event live from Manchester, Where Next for Leveling Up. We're delighted to be partnering with Policy at Manchester, the University of Manchester's Policy Impact Institute uh, for this event. Uh, I'm Tom Pope, the Institute's Deputy Chief Economist based here in Manchester. With the local elections now passed, we're at most 18 months away from the next general election. And a commitment to level up the country was a big part of the last government's manifesto, or this government's manifesto at the last election. I and mean, that was fleshed out more in the leveling out white paper about 15 months ago. So how much more progress can the government demonstrate before that next election? This isn't the first government to look at regional inequalities and try to address them, and it won't be the last. Um, so what should the agenda do next? How should we change? How should it move forwards uh, with future governments uh, to deliver a true change in Greater Manchester and, be and beyond? Is it focusing on the right policies? How could it be delivered better? Well, I'm pleased to introduce a brilliant panel today for a timely discussion on these questions. On the panel today, we have on my far right, Andy Burnham, the mayor of Greater Manchester, who needs no further introduction. Uh, on my immediate right. <laughs> uh, next to him, we have Debbie Abrahams, the MP for Oldham East and Saddleworth. Welcome, Debbie. Uh, on my far left, we have uh, Andy Westwoods, the professor of government and practice <laughs> at University of Manchester. And next to me, uh, Jem Williams, the FT's North of England's correspondent. Uh, so just before we begin, a little bit of housekeeping. We'll be live tweeting from at IFG events with the hashtag IFG leveling up. So please do join in the conversation and follow along there. Um, for those people in the room, we will have questions in the room. Please be thinking of those now and just ask when, when that time comes, wait for the mic to come for you so that we can hear what you're saying. For those online, you can ask your questions via Slido, which should be just next to the window that you're uh, viewing this through. And so without further ado, I think we can get started. And Andy Burnham, if I'll start with you, how has the government's focus on levelling up delivered uh, for Greater Manchester in the last few years? And where should the regional policy agenda go next? Okay, thanks very much indeed. Tom, good afternoon, uh, everybody. It's great uh, to see you. University and the Institute for Government uh, cooperating on this. I think it's a really good moment for us to be having this this conversation and to answer the question that you've you've just uh, you've just posed, uh, Tom. So I'll start with something I said on the television yesterday on Sky. Devolution in England is working. More than that, I would say it's the most successful public policy uh, at this at this moment in time. I've not read Jen's piece today, so I'm, I'm speaking more for. for for our part of the world, but if I look at, actually though, if I look around the mayoralties across, across the country, there are good things happening in all of them. There's a sense of, um, uh, of direction, uh, of, there's energy around this agenda. I mean, if I just cast my mind back through some recent events in recent days, Eurovision, my good friend in Liverpool, did a pretty good job there with all of the team. Um, fantastic for the northwest of England to see uh, to see it shining so brightly in the in the world spotlight did us all proud. Think back uh, to the middle of last week, the northern mayors who repeatedly uh, made the case, I should say the Labour mayors, we, we have repeatedly uh, made the case for trains in the north of England to become a political priority. Um, we called for uh, not just northern to be put on, under public control as they were a few years ago, but now Trans Pennine Express. I think that shows the influence uh, that, that, we, that we have. And we're using it carefully. It's not about, uh, all of us would say, you know, it's not just old school politics, party politics, so how can you get an advantage of the other side? We're not doing it for those reasons. We're speaking for our places. It's a place first approach. And I think that's why the voices of the mayors carries weight across the country. And I would include Andy Street uh, in this. You know, that place first approach from the bottom up, it, it gives, kind of strength to what's being said that has to be heard. And I think increasingly you can see how that is changing political life uh, in, in Britain. Specifically to address Tom's question on Greater Manchester, let me give you two examples of the real difference that uh, devolution has made in Greater Manchester as borne out by the evidence, not just you know, statements, uh, uh, claims that I might make. One is and I'm, I think Debbie Abrahams, my, my good friend Debbie, is with us today. We'll talk maybe more about this. But um, on health, the um, Lancet reported 
last year that we have improved, made improvements on life expectancy that go beyond what, what would have been and what was, would have been expected in Greater Manchester and what was seen uh, elsewhere, which is a phenomenal achievement. We've got um, Kate Arden here, our former lead director of public health, and you were critically involved in that, in that work, Kate, and thank you for what, for what you did to, to support it. What, is, what lies behind it? For me, it's the power of devolution to join the dots between different things, because health is created in, in homes, in communities, in workplaces, or not created in those, in those places. It could be damaged in those places as well. What the, what the uh, research said is that it's the high degree of alignment in Greater Manchester between not just public bodies, but public bodies, private sector, community and voluntary sector, faith sector. So everybody, if you like, kind of facing in the same direction towards the same challenges and then pulling in the same direction. That is what makes the difference. And you could see that on an issue like homelessness and street homelessness that we, you know, we, we, we reduced significantly over recent times. Uh, and we haven't had the increase that other cities have seen in the cost of living crisis. So that approach that we're developing, that kind of sense of one Greater Manchester all pulling in the same direction, is actually what, what changes things for the better. The other example I would give is, a, is an economic example. In 2022, uh, as a city region, we, we recorded GVA growth of 4.5%. That was better than the UK average of 4.1%. It kind of bears out what you see, doesn't it? And you, can, you see the city, you see how quickly it's, it's changing. Um, we're predicted to have higher growth than UK average for the next two years beyond this as well. So, you know, this is, this is being sustained or, or is expected to be sustained. Bloomberg reported recently that there were more new job adverts in Greater Manchester than anywhere else in the country, including London. So this is changing things. It is a, it, it is a growing success story. And the question I think, if I could address in the second part of my remarks, is where next? Well, we're about to lay that out, so it is good timing. I can give you a, a bit of a sneak preview, really, on, on wh where, we're going, where we're going next. It's, it's, it's about now properly fixing the fundamentals that are holding this city region back. And specifically, I'm thinking transport, I'm thinking education, and I'm thinking housing. So you'll all know that we signed a, a trailblazer devolution deal with the government, to Michael Gove's great credit and, and other colleagues in government that they were prepared to work with us in that way. It was a really constructive process, which I think says something about the maturity of devolution in England or the increasing maturity that we were able to conduct the process in that, in that way and credit to the government for listening to the calls that we made. As it says on the tin of, the, of this deal, you know, we're now required to blaze a trail. And that trail is exactly what is going to be blazed uh, in, the next, in, in the next few months because, you know, we asked for these powers for a reason. Um, so if I could, you know, perhaps start with transport, it's the obvious one. It's the one we've already made most progress on. Buses are going back under public control. Uh, we're just over three months away from the start of the B network. Um, next month, we will put out... Uh, an integrated fare structure for Greater Manchester that covers bus and tram, uh, and that will make public transport much more affordable and better value than it's been in the past, so look, look out for that. But we will also set out our plans to bring rail now into the B network vision. So bus and tram integrated fully by the start of 2025, and then commuter rail services, you know, our version of TFL overground, TFGM overground, or B network overground, <coughs> whatever it will be called, that is what we will we will lay out um, towards the back end of, of next month, uh, and that's that's an exciting vision of a fully integrated public transport system by 2030, which I think will 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 further make this a place to invest, because you know, we're world class in many respects, not in transport, but we're about to to fix that in a very substantial uh, way. Another of the fundamentals holding us back is housing. And I think we all think of the, um, the tragic loss of Awab Ishak, uh, a case that has sent shockwaves around, around housing, not just here, but across the country. We saw it in the pandemic as well, though, didn't we? How housing damages the health of, of too, many, uh, too many of our residents, not just the quality of the home, but the lack of security in terms of housing that, that, people, that people have. Again, we're now on a mission to fix that and we're bringing forward a Greater Manchester Good Landlord Charter. 
Um, also, we'll, we'll be making announcements about that in June. The trailblazer deal gave us the ability to start thinking about the linkage between housing benefit and housing standards and how we might use that as a lever to drive improvements, particularly in the private rented sector. So we'll be saying more about that then. I'll finish on the <clears throat> topic that's on my mind most at the moment, and that's education. And something that we're going to be announcing on Wednesday, so I can't give you all the details today, but I can give you enough to, to give you a clear sense of where we're going. Fixing technical education seems to me to be the single biggest thing that this country needs to do if it's to have a positive growth story in the, in the coming decades. You know, if you speak to any potential investor, they will always talk about the talent and the need for talent and you know, recruiting um, uh, young people um, <clears throat> in the modern economy. At the moment, in my view, the education system is not pointing towards the modern economy at all. It's, well, it, it is geared towards the university route. That's what the English baccalaureate does. It actually says that on the government website that the subjects in it are the ones that are most favored by universities and are the ones that would help people probably get the best chance of a good, a good degree place. There's nothing wrong with that on its own, but there is if that's the only thing that is in front of people at secondary school. And this is what we want to fix. We believe there should be two clear, equal routes for young people from 14 to 19. One academic, one technical, but actually the, the, the two routes could take you to the same place, you know, a, a degree. One route actually might get you to that same place without debt, which might make it an even more attractive route, you could, you could argue. So what we're going to announce on Wednesday is our plans for a Manchester baccalaureate. So to mirror the EBAC, we will have an MBAC, or we're proposing an MBAC. And what is that? Basically, it's a judgment about the subjects that our employers in our economy want. So the logic of it is if you follow what it's saying, you will be maximizing your chances of a good job in the greater Manchester economy, just as you'd be maximizing your chance of a university place if you follow the EBAC. So finally, we'd have that sense of parity be between the two. And what we're trying to do is, is build the journey in exactly the same way that it already is laid out on the university route, where you have English baccalaureate, A-levels, UCAS degree. We want Manchester baccalaureate, MBAC, T-levels for other qualifications as well, I, I hasten to add. Um, but T-levels, we're willing to try and make that reform work. It, it might need changing, but we, we will definitely give it a good go. GMAX, which is our localized version of UCAS, which is a single portal uh, for, for work-related opportunity, and then apprenticeship or degree apprenticeship or a higher, higher qualification. I, I am really excited by this. I think this is the single biggest thing I could do to change life chances in, in Greater Manchester. Also to improve people's health. You know, too many young people here at 14 or 15 are losing a sense of direction because you know, they don't relate to the university route, but nothing is put in front of them that helps guide them. And our economy suffers as a result. So this is what we're going to unveil, uh, unveil on Wednesday. Um, I hope the government will continue to work with us to, to make it a reality. But if you think about a city region where, at present, two thirds of our young people either do not take the EBAC or do not attain it, you realize quickly, don't you, that something fundamental is needed to, to fix that and give them a clear route. All young people in the city region with a clear path in life, that is what we're, what we're after. And my last point will just be this, you know, I've seen Greater Manchester through the generations. I came back here from university in the early 1990s, 1991, and tried to work here because I wanted to stay here. But things were leaving here and closing in that time. And basically, like everybody else of my generation, I had to go south to get on in life. That's, that's what we did. And so many people from the northwest of England did that in the 70s and the 80s and even into the 90s. In the 90s, things started to change. You know, credit to Sir Howard, Sir Richard. You know, the organizations were brought to this city region that simply weren't there before. You know, names, international names, global names, Bank of New York, BBC. You know, people came here in a much more meaningful way in that period. 
But actually, if I'm honest, it was often people being relocated here rather than our own residents coming through and, and taking those jobs. So here's the next chapter of where Greater Manchester is going. You think of this place when all of the talent that's growing up in our 10 boroughs has a path to this amazing success story that, that is this city or, or is this city region. You know, all of them. And we have a, a skill system is absolutely locked on to the needs of the Greater Manchester uh, economy. You, you can see how, you know, when, when we as a city region are making use of all of the talent and everyone has a pathway to be part of what we're doing here, that is a proper game changer. And that is where devolution in Greater Manchester is going next. Thank you for listening. Thanks very much for that, Andy. That was brilliant and a really, really helpful summary. We're very grateful for the sneak preview as well. Um, we'll definitely be tuning in on Wednesday, nonetheless. Andy, if I can come to, to you next. And your research is focused on regional economic policy, long before called Leveling Up was in the political lexicon, uh, which isn't to say you've been working on it for too long. Um, I'm interested in, in your perspective on, on that agenda, I guess particularly the UK government's um, approach to it and whether it needs to focus on different policies to achieve lasting change. Sure, well, um, thanks. Uh, is this what, yeah, this is working? Yeah. Um, th thanks very much, Tom. And um, first of all, I should say thank you to the Institute for Government and Policy at Manchester and the uh, uh, People's History Museum, two of my favourite organisations, uh, um, putting today on. I think it's brilliant that, uh, um, that this is happening. But to, to um, tackle the question, I think, I think, I mean, there are always different things you can do, um, but it doesn't always mean you should always try and do different things. I mean, in a sense, that's been one of the kind of problems bedeviling local and regional policy, particularly in, in England uh, for the last 30 or 40 years, which is that kind of constant churn of policy initiatives, but also institutional kind of makeup. Um, and kind of the way that any of those kind of initiatives or institutions are funded. So in many ways, kind of it's, it's, um, it's a good place to start, not thinking about what are we going to change, but what are we going to keep going with. And, and I think this, this, in many ways, is a kind of quite extraordinary moment where I think you can kind of look forward, um, possibly over the next decade, and say, actually, there's quite a lot of stability and consensus around kind of the institutions in particular that will make up um, English sort of regional and local devolution and the way that they then try and address, um, you know, that, that problematic long-term stubborn local and regional inequality that we know exists and we know is going to take time uh, to address. So I think, I think you know, think knowing that, that kind of um, there is some consensus now around uh, mayors, around combined authorities, around kind of devolution and the types of powers that devolution can be made up of, including skills and transport and housing and other stuff too, I think is a, is a, is a really rare moment. And actually, you know, the Institute for Government have written about this. Um, those are the areas that, that are subject to the worst churn in kind of British policy, regional policy, industrial policy, and technical education. So, so actually kind of thinking, you know, not just uh, are the institutions potentially going to be kind of stable, more stable over the long term, but those areas that are so essential to their powers might be too. And it means, you know, we can kind of genuinely, I think, look, look forward and say, that means there's going to be um, the stability within which, you know, Andy can kind of uh, fix the transport system or fix kind of uh, uh, um, the, the things that are going wrong in the kind of technical education system. And, and that is such a rare uh, moment to be able to do kind of with any confidence that um, it's, uh, it's, it's worth remarking on. And I think, so, so I, think, I think in that sense, you know, a bit of optimism. I think the other area where, where I think we should be optimistic and um, takes us back to the levelling up white paper, there's, there's a lot there that I think has already begun to wane, <laughs> not least kind of levelling up as a kind of absolute top agenda for the government. Um, but, um, but, but there are things within that, I think, that can also help a future government, whether it's a Labour government or whatever, uh, uh, and, and individual kind of mayors and, and uh, uh, local areas. And that's broadly that kind of six capitals framework. You know, six sets of things that are going to make a difference to places. And, uh, you know, it's the, it's the collection of stuff, it's, it's infrastructure, it's R&D, it's human capital, 
but it's also institutional capital, social capital. It's the kind of links between people and things that I think really helps us kind of think about what we can do in, in different policy areas if we put them together and think about it. So, so for me, um, yes, there's always stuff we can change and always stuff we can add, um, but, but it's, that, it's that stability in approach that's probably the reason I've got to do that as well. But thanks, thanks very much, Andy. That's that's uh, really helpful. And yeah, c certainly lots of themes that chime with with IFG work in this area. Uh, Jen, if I can come to you next, I think we've heard quite a positive picture actually from from both of the Andes, um, which I'm not sure necessarily chimes with with public sentiment here. We're now at most 18 months from the next general election. What will the government be able to point to as its levelling up achievements by then? Hello, it's lovely to be here. Um, I've not been to the People's History Museum for ages, so this is a, this is a lovely treat. Um, so I think my observation on where the government's got to since the white paper was published is that most of the things you can point to as achievements have largely come directly out of Michael Gove's department. And some of them are quite technocratic, and they're not things that you can put on election leaflets, but they're kind of about the hard wiring of how you um, get this policy to kind of be embedded within government. So, you know, for example, the fact that he's setting up the office for local government, and the vast majority of people out there will have no idea what that is. I'll be honest, I'm not even sure I totally know what, what that is. But it is a recognition of the fact that perhaps we haven't been the strongest on tracking what's actually been happening within local government, both its strengths and its weaknesses. Um, so, uh, yeah, as I say, not necessarily something that you would put on an election leaflet. Um, something more high profile is clearly the kind of devolution deals that, um, that Andy's just negotiated and that Andy Street have just negotiated to the trailblazers. Um, but also some of the new devolution deals that have been signed over the past year. So the North East, for anyone who's followed what's, what, what, you know, the story, that the start saga that led up to that, that's quite a big deal getting that over the line, I think. Um, so there has clearly been pro uh, progress uh, on the uh, devolution side and aspects of this, I think, uh, of, of the white paper in general is supposed to be uh, enshrined in the levelling up uh, bill, although I'm not quite clear on, it seems to have been heavily amended, so I'm not quite sure where that's up to. So a lot of these things are sort of relatively technocratic things that were about the Department for levelling up, trying to make sure that this is kind of not something that can be easily uh, unpicked. I suppose the other thing that is a political thing that will get put on election leaflets at election time will be the various capital projects that have come through from the competitive bidding pots. Um, and there will be some. Uh, and some I think you can make a stronger argument for in terms of the regional inequality agenda than others. I think you know the money that's gone into Blackpool uh, to uh, to develop their college, for example, I think is potentially significant. Other things may be less so. Um, and I think we need to recognise that um, for a whole range of reasons, a lot of those things won't have been built in time for the next election anyway. So. Um, I think the problems come in when you start getting outside of the Department of Leveling Up. Um, and I think a lot of these other policy areas, it seems to me, I can't see a huge amount of progress. Yes, you can certainly say on skills because skills wraps into the devolution agenda. But if you take something like buses, progress on buses is, as far as I can see, mainly as a result of mayors deciding for themselves that they're then gonna try and do something about their bus networks and use the powers that they've got. I'm not clear that we have really made a lot of progress nationally since the 2019 election when it comes to addressing the fact that we've got a broken bus market. And we do look too much in the debate at trains, like we do, and I'm guilty of it. Um, but the, the, the uh, many of the places that we are talking about are heavily reliant on those bus services that are not working. Um, equally, on trains, you know, we know that the, um, integrated rail plan was not the version that we originally expected it to be. We know that the high-speed rail network was not what was originally billed. Uh, clearly, there have been problems with Trans Pennine Express, so essentially that's had to be rescued. Um, and those are just kind of your starters for 10 in transport before you start getting into the fact that the health inequality agenda just seems to have disappeared, as far as I can see. So um, that would kind of be the point, the things that I would that I would point to. I think there will be things, but I think as Andy says, a lot of this stuff has been about trying to lay the groundwork for whoever it is that comes into the next, whoever wins the next election, that it is at least has begun to be baked in as an agenda within government. Brilliant, thanks very much, Jen. That's, that's really helpful. Um, 
Debbie, come to you now. The Labour, Labour Party probably won't adopt the phrase levelling up, um, but it has made clear that addressing regional inequalities will be a priority. So based on what you've seen in, in Oldham East and Saddleworth, how would you like to see that agenda be focused? Uh, good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Lovely to be here. Um, I mean, th some really interesting contributions. Um, I, I think just from my perspective, if we just be clear what we mean by levelling up and, and what uh, inequalities it's meant to be uh, addressing. For, for me, we've known for decades, really, in terms of the inequalities in, in, in GDP, in, in terms of productivity, pay, educational attainment, um, and the ultimate um, impact on, on health. And that's my professional background. Uh, I used to work in, in, in public health work for many years with Kate there as, as, as well. And the, the ultimate outcome from all of these inequalities, that, uh, uh, particularly the socioeconomic inequalities, are that we, in the north, um, will expect to live about two years less than the south. Uh, and there's a really good uh, little book here uh, from Claire Bambra uh, and colleagues uh, on, on the detail around that and what levelling up should be doing to, to address that. Um, but but my, my constituency in Oldham, uh, if you have a look at all key indicators, you will unfortunately see that, that we're still um, not doing well. So we do, we're, we're not doing well around educational attainment in terms of poverty. Uh, in terms of pay, I mean, and and is absolutely right. There was a fabulous um, piece in the Lancet uh, at the end of last year, which showed if it hadn't been for the work that Andy was doing as uh, as, as the first mayor uh, for, for for Greater Manchester, it would have been even worse. Um, and they were actually actually able to quantify uh, the the impacts around that. So do do have a look at that. And then of course COVID hit and really exposed how these inequalities uh, were, were uh, what they were, first of all, and ha the, the actual uh, and ultimate uh, outcome. We had a very, very unfair and unequal experience of co COVID. But I just want to touch on one thing. Uh, I absolutely agree that devolution is a key part of it, and Andy embodies really how to grapple with this, even though, and I can remember when I was, uh, and as PPS at the time, when uh, when we first had news of the Devo Mank uh, uh, health deal, it's, it was actually the combined budgets were less that was devolved to Manchester than the, the separate uh, budgets that the government had. It was about two billion less. So Andy's been working uh, to do more with less. Oldham is exactly the same. We have the council have had about 230 million cuts in, 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 in resources. Other agencies have had equivalent uh, cuts. Two in three pounds has been taken. And if I could just, we have been fortunate uh, uh, in, in terms of some of our bidding. So for example, we've had 24 million pounds in terms of the uh, towns fund. We've had 20 million pounds in terms of the leveling up fund, but I'm sure Anybody with basic maths will see that the 230 against the 44 million don't quite add up. And this is, that's, this is repeated across the, the country, unfor unfortunately. There was, a, again, a lovely paper from Michael Marmot that looked at it and, and, and said, well, yes, we, we need to recognize that the, the white paper is, is a good paper. The, what Andy was talking about, the, um, the, the, the six uh, capital areas are what we'd want to do but it needs to be reflected in the type of investment in public spending that we're seeing. So 4.8 million for the next um, uh, three years, no, sorry, 21 to, uh, 21 to 24. If you compare what Germany did uh, back in the 80s um, when uh, the East and West re uh, were, were reunified, it was the equivalent of 70 billion pounds a year. And that made, that was, we were able to see that tangible difference. So there's been, and we know this, most deprived areas have received, the, uh, has had the most extreme cuts. Uh, and if we are serious about leveling up, we need to make sure that not just in terms of devolution, but in terms of, uh, of centrally controlled budgets, they also need to be um, more fairly uh, a portion.
So, and, and can, I, can I just say a couple of other things? The, the party have come up with some fabulous I ideas, but I'd like, I would also, and I, I really do support the uh, mission approach beyond the sort of election cycle. Um, but I would like to see a, a greater level around health system working so that, uh, a, again, under previous uh, Labour governments, uh, that there was real cross-departmental work uh, working um, so that you can see the impact from one department on the other. And I'm thinking about health in, in, in particular. Um, but that we'd also have evidence-based and, and progressive uh, policy. So I, I put, I bang on every finance bill that relates to the budget around what is the regional assessment uh, on the impacts of, of, of local economies and what will this mean in terms of the impact on health. It can be done. Kate and I have done it previously in our, our jobs. Why aren't we doing this so we know that areas like mine are going to benefit? Um, and, and finally, in terms of the funding formula, I can remember again when, when Andy was uh, Shadow Health Secretary, the government tried to change the formula which has a health inequality weighting. Why aren't we making sure that we have and direct our public investment to the areas that need it? Brilliant. Thanks very much, Debbie. Andy, I know you need to head off briefly, but I know, do you have any reflections on what the others have, have said briefly? Oh, brilliant. Um, do you want to take, take the mic? I, um, you know, I agree with everything that's, that's been said, and you know, I, I'm giving you the upbeat version because it does feel upbeat from where I am, but there's a realistic sort of assessment about the state of local government. Um, which, as Debbie's just said and others have said, is, is, not, is not good. I guess what I would say, though, is English devolution, the model that's being developed, is doing more to change parts of the country that have been neglected than anything else I've ever seen. And consequently, it really needs to be sort of, you know, really embraced by everybody, because if we can do this much with what we've had, imagine what we could do if we had a proper arrangement of the kind that the US cities have or the, or the European, European cities. You know, I, I um, when the struck was when Debbie was talking about Germany, does, is it understood that Germany, which we had a hand in creating, if you like, the, the sort of the lender model of Germany, and that was to stop political power, I think, concentrating too much in in one place in the aftermath of the Second World War. But, you know, is everybody aware that they have in their constitution a basic law that requires an equivalence of living standards between the different lenders? Imagine if we had that. Why don't we have that? You know, life in this country, would, if we'd have done the same here as we did in Germany after the war, this would be a very different, very different country uh, now. So I kind of feel we, we've stumbled to a point where as a country, not so much us here in Greater Manchester, because I think we've done a lot of the, you know, a lot of the work has been done by people here, not necessarily the government that's done the levelling up. I think it's been built by generations of politicians here to put us in this position. It's not a, an overnight thing. You know, I think we really must remember that. This has been built in a painstaking way by generations of local leaders since the abolition of the Greater Manchester Council in the 80s. So it's been hard won, the, the ground that, that's, been, that's been made. But just think about Greater Manchester kind of pulling with the grain as opposed to fighting against it as it's, as it's so often done. I think all I would say is this, this works. And you know, for those of you who will say, well, where's the accountability and is it strong enough? As I said yesterday as well, let's, let's get these arrangements really solid now in terms of you know, uh, how people like me are, are, held, are held to account. I don't fear that at all. Um, as a former cabinet minister. What I do know is, having been at that level of politics and been at this level, I much prefer this. Uh, I think this is real, it's exciting, it can make change happen. You can actually join the dots between different public services, you can break down the white hole silos, you can take a place, not a party approach, and when you do all of those things, lo and behold, things change and things get better and people buy in. You know, it's not, it's not that complicated in, in some ways, is it? White hole has to let go. Whitehall has to, there is no justification anymore for them to say we know best, because they don't. They don't know better about what Greater Manchester needs than people in Greater Manchester. It's as simple as that. And I think we just, I, I felt in the last process there was a change in Whitehall. I, I mentioned it was a constructive process. And I think that's because the number of supporters and allies we have has increased quite significantly. 
across all of the different departments. And I know that is a sea change in my time as mayor. It felt like increasingly we were going with the grain. There are still pockets of resistance, if I could put it like that. But I would say that's where the reality is now. The, the, the majority of the Whitehall machine is, is buying in and it's, it's isolated resistance now. But I would, you know, rather than look like we're always beating up on Whitehall, well, let's give credit. You know, if finally that penny has dropped in a significant way in Whitehall and people are saying, no, we can see how T levels are more likely to work if we go with what Greater Manchester is saying. Or, you know, we can see how we can do something meaningful about housing standards if we kind of build from the bottom up with what Greater Manchester is doing. You know, you can deliver government policies more quickly, can't you, if you, if you, work, in, you work in this way. And I, I personally feel that finally there is that, we, we've, we've hit the end of the beginning and we're now in a new phase of English devolution and this is where it starts to get really exciting. Brilliant, thanks Andy. Other Andy, um, you, you mentioned the six capitals at the start and Debbie referred to, to the, the East German example um, where obviously a huge amount of money was, has been spent over many years. Um, Andy B has suggested you know, devolution can sort of fill some of that gap between maybe the, the money that's going in and the, the stuff we need to achieve. But do you think the government has to be, you know, if, if we're realistically not going to spend as much as, as East Germany did, are we going to have to be more selective and sort of refocus on particular bits of the agenda, or does that just not work? Well, look, I think uh, money matters. <laughs> um, and if, if you take, um, take something like the, um, the skills agenda, uh, and, and uh, as Andy says, the, the steps in the deeper devolution deal in Greater Manchester and the West Midlands uh, skills is a really interesting part. It, uh, you know, lo looking forward to hearing more about the MBAC on Wednesday, but um, potentially one of the most interesting things is the, is, is the sort of joint governance model of 16 to 19 that, uh, um, that actually is quite similar to the health model, uh, which is really a joint governance model. So, so the importance of, of, uh, of mayors and kind of Andy in Greater Manchester, Andy Street in the West Midlands working and finding a way to work with DFE in this case, in that joint governance model is, is really, really significant and quite exciting. We, we, uh, they, they may be amongst the pockets of resistance. <laughs> uh, we shall see. I mean, they have been in the past um, and um, that, that might be uh, an, an interesting one to watch. But I think, I think Taking that as an example, you know, the, the main deliverers of that are going to be kind of FE colleges in Greater Manchester. Now, they've been battered almost as much as local authorities in the last 10 to 15 years, not just in terms of the cash that they haven't got to spend, but also their lack of autonomy in the system. So I think, kind of, you know, there are two other things that we need to fix if we're going to have half a chance of getting the kind of skills problem that is a problem in Greater Manchester, as it is in other cities. We, you know, we're going to have to kind of work out a better way of funding them, which is going to require more money. Um, and we're going to have to work out a better way of involving colleges as strategic partners in the way that we kind of develop policy too. And actually, the joint governance model does do that. So, you know, that's quite an exciting, if in Jen's words, you know, it's, a bit, it's, it's definitely in the technocratic list. <laughs> it's not going to win you any elections, if my experience is anything to go by, but, uh, but, but it's the sort of thing that really matters. But you're not going to do any of that without a significantly increased kind of financial settlement for FE in particular in, in the next spending review in the next parliament. Brilliant, thanks. I think, Andy, have you got another comment? I'm yeah. sorry to come back here, because I, I do have to leave after this one, but I just wanted to make one point really and it was it was kind of a reflection on what Jen was saying and I think you know I, I go with everything that was being said about you know it's one government department that's really do, doing a lot of the, the work and are the others buying in I, you know I do think they are buying in more but I think there's still that, that critique is a is, is a fair is a fair one at this point in time so my last kind of kind of thought to leave you with is how you know how do we get a German equivalent of a st structurally embedding the concept that there should be equivalent living standards between all the regions of, of England and all the regions and nations of the UK. I, I, I think this is where political reform comes in and um, where we really need to see these two things as, as one. Because if it's sort of grace and favor, a, a minister decides it's gonna give a power through devolution and it's a different deal everywhere and it's all a bit ad hoc and well, I don't think that ever in the end gets you to where you really want to get to. Um, I think you've got to have a sort of system that structurally 
gives equality to all people and all places when it comes to the national debate, the ability to get resources. And, and as somebody who was in that system for a long time, I can only conclude that nothing short of a complete rewiring of Britain is what is needed. And I have come down in favor of proportional representation because I think until you have a political system where every vote counts, and we're not just looking at every general election at marginal constituencies, that is the kind of context in which you don't get equity in terms of the way money is delivered. It's not following need. I think you need to have uh, a different uh, political system. Personally, I, I, would, I would remove the whip from MPs, trust people's judgment who go into parliament, let them, you know, let them act as proper, proper agents for their areas with power. And, and actually, at the moment, the current political system overly empowers the civil service over parliament. And I think the exact reverse is what is, is, what is needed. Uh, a parliament that is able to, to act for all places and all areas in a, in a fair way. And that also, of course, points to a, an elected Senate of the nations and regions to replace the Lords. Because you know, how, how can we have fairness when our national parliament currently does not, does not provide equal representation for all parts of the country? There are many more people in the House of Lords born and live within the M25 than, than uh, were born in the north of England. I think there were as or not far off as many people who went to school at Eton as, as, as lords who actually were born in the north of England. You know, and how does that that deliver fairness across? It can't, can it? It's really it, impossible. So you need a major parliamentary reform combined with maximum devolution to the city region level, but also to the, to the rural areas and a model of devolution. That's, you, know, you need to fill in the map of England, basically and have a framework where everyone can move to as much as they want uh, under, under, that, under that structure. So that's just my, my kind of parting shot. I think you, know, you won't embed this properly without the political reform alongside it so that we can move from a country that has definitely allowed certain places and geographies to have a hold over uh, things um, and, and certain perspectives on life have had more of a kind of prominence in British public life we need to move from that to a, a situation where all, all areas are, are equally empowered to improve the, 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 um, the, the life chances of their citizens. And you know, I, I think this is why this is only the, the, the beginnings of a, of, a, of a new agenda for the country, isn't it? We've got to follow through with that political reform. And I think it's really important that we make that point. Sorry, sorry to come back in. That's on perfect. That. Thanks very much. I'm keen to get Jen and Debbie's perspective on that, but I'm also keen to hear your questions. So could you pre please raise your hand if you have a question in the room. We also have several online. I'll take a few at a time. So yeah, the lady in the second row just on the right. Hi. Um, we've talked about devolution devolution <coughs> as a um, form of community power and we've talked about equal representation but how can we ensure that authentic community power is a priority moving forward with levelling up particularly in communities that are considered left behind how can we make sure that we give them a voice that is heard and that they have some power over decisions that impact on them Great, thank you. Sorry, I should have said, please do say who you are and where you're from so we know who we're talking to. Suzanne Wilson, University of Central Lancashire. Thank you. And then there was one other question, just to your right, Maddie. Thank you. I'm uh, Professor Kate Arden. I'm the, I've been mentioned a few times. I am uh, the former Director of Public Health in Wigan, uh, former lead DPH uh, for Health Protection here in Greater Manchester. And I now am Honorary Professor at uh, Salford University and I co-chair uh, Reform UK's Reimagining Health uh, Expert Advisory Panel, so very much interested in health reform. My question to the panel, just I guess building on the excellent uh, contributions from all of the speakers, is should we be devolution by default and design, and should we be pushing for this? Um, and should the onus be on those defending centralisation, and I do agree with you, Andy, there, are resi there is resistance to, to devolution, uh, to justify why the UK should continue to be a global outlier in terms of the localism agenda, which is particularly bizarre when you consider that a lot of the public services we are most proud of uh, actually come from the era when uh, uh, localism and municipalism 
was the, the actual norm. And to underpin that in terms of democratic accountability, is it time for a new chartist movement with updated 21st century six principles of chartism? Thank you. Great, thank you very much. I think the People's History Museum is definitely a good place to be having this conversation, isn't it? Uh, Jen, do you want to come back on, on any of that? Maybe some of the some of the proposals Andy made, but also questions about authentic community power and devolution by default. Um, okay, so on devolution by default, I'm um, not exactly going to make myself unpopular, but um, I think that the kind of first year that I've spent at the Financial Times has been quite interesting because it's meant that I've been able to see how devolution is evolving in other parts of the country. And I think it's fair to say that Grace Manchester has got the advantage of being quite a mature uh, institution on this, not only because um, it, it, it got its deal early, but because uh, there had been a, a certain culture of um, political and officer led, uh, leadership that had sustained, I suppose, which then means that you kind of get this self-sustaining culture um, that, that has a degree of maturity to it. And I don't think that that's necessarily the case everywhere which is not an argument to say that we shouldn't be devolving. I think it's an argument to say that if you're in favor of decentralization, then you need to be self-critical about it as you go along. It's an evolving institutional map at the moment. And some places have only, I mean, some places haven't even started yet. I mean, some of them won't get their mayors until next year. Um, and if you want it to work, then you have to kind of um, be honest with yourself about where the strengths and the weaknesses lie as you go along so personally we you know we're such an international outlier it seems mad not to be aiming for decentralization um but i think you need to be uh, honest about it and not get too hung up on the idea that if you if if you are honest about that and if you do highlight the weaknesses that somehow that's going to hand somebody in whitehall of who doesn't want to devolve some De Sir humphrey somewhere that you're going to hand them some kind of victory because actually the only way that this is going to work is if you create a system that is mature and that can hold itself to account. Um, so yeah, I'll stop rambling, but um, for, for anyone who's read my article on Teesside this morning, uh, I've, uh, it's very much on my brain at the moment. Thanks very much, Jen. Debbie? Um, I, I think uh, Jen's probably um, answered that. Uh, well, I agree with what she said, basically. I, I think um, it's uh, you and you and I know each other well, Kate. So you know, in terms of the principle of devolution, absolutely. But there are some communities where there aren't natural boundaries, um, and so there needs to be some thought in terms of how you would um, coalesce around a particular area. Um, so, so, so we, I don't think that can be prescribed. That needs to be done with with uh, in conjunction with with communities. Um, but I think, uh, you know, as I say, uh, Jen hit the nail on the head about the maturity of of, of Greater Manchester and, and the benefits that, that we've we've seen as a result of of that. I just want to pick up on the on, on the point around um, making sure that we go beyond that, though, and make sure that, um, and it certainly was in my, on my list of what else needs to be done. So I'm a real fan uh, in terms of um, citizens' assemblies. And it gets to the point that Andy was saying about power and power inequalities um, on, on from the political level. But there are other um, forms of power inequalities as well. And that inc includes how we can actually um, in include and, um, as I say, involve uh, local people in decisions that affect their lives. There was an excellent um, national citizens assembly that was done on climate change um, absolutely excellent and it showed what could happen again in Ireland it's part of their constitution and it involves people on ongoing issues that matter to people um, and it's so I think it's a really important way to actively engage with people as I say so people don't aren't done to they are pa a partner in decisions that affect their their lives I think that's and, and on Andy's suggestion that the whip should be taken away from all MPs. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I certainly am a fan of PR. I've been open about that. It's not my party's position at the point, and, but it gets back to the issue around political power. People invest in us when they are um, when they give us their their vote, and then that's it for the next four years. And as I say, the pa citizens' assembly. I also do my own community meetings at a local level, uh, at a, a sub-neighbourhood level, so that, that we can pick up on issues and work with communities uh, uh, around that. 
I mean, there, there needs to be some discipline, um, but I think uh, ongoing engagement, active engagement with all politicians of all parties is, is pretty important. Great, thanks very much. Very diplomatically answered. Uh, Andy, if I might come to a couple of questions from online that, that okay. maybe for you, Andy, feel free to add in on those yep. as well. The most popular one is how can we stop the practice of centrally deployed funding for forcing places to compete against each other? I mean, there's a related one from my colleague, Jill Rutter. Could genuine fiscal devolution work? Or would it be a distraction that would exacerbate inequality? Gosh, you hit me with a couple of big ones <laughs> that I wasn't expecting. Um, yeah, so I think, um, well, let's let's start with the fiscal devolution uh, first. I mean, again, something at the sort of, uh, in the detail, the technocratic box, but really important. Um, one of the problems we've got with fiscal devolution is that is that because that um, inequality has been so baked in for so long that if you give people if you give places too much fiscal devolution straight away you basically put them at a disadvantage because they don't have the tax income to sort of spend on on the services that do exist let alone kind of more things that you might want to do so so I think I, you, you know I don't think that should stop you thinking about fiscal devolution but it does suggest it's going to take you quite a long time <laughs> and it's going to you're going to have to depend on some fiscal transfer or quite a lot of fiscal transfer uh, uh, as as you kind of make that progress so I think I think you know that's important and it's really important not to get kind of sucked in. I mean it's it's easy for me to say it's really important not to get sucked into a kind of uh, uh, a reaction to fiscal devolution that basically says we don't want people adding more taxes at the local level because that's the that's the easiest kind of popular way to say you know don't give these powers to raise uh, new taxes to the to the local level whether that's mayors or whatever um the 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 first question what was the first bit the first online about well, it was about com the, com the competitive funding pots and how we oh, can yeah, stop yeah, that yeah, happening well, yeah, that's easier that's <laughs> easier because everybody now says they're a terrible idea even michael gove and the white paper says they're a terrible idea even though they continue to roll them out um it, it we have to we simply have to move from this not just the idea that we're constantly competing for pots of cash to do anything from the center but the fact that there are so many of them and they aren't kind of coordinated and co you know the, the the sort of cumulative effect is lessened because there are literally hundreds of pots so i think i think we're in a, again we're in a peculiar position where where labor are committing to ending that culture and the government are committing to ending that culture uh, it, and uh, as they have done in the in the white paper so um i'll believe it when it happens um, and it, again easier said than done but it's clearly is something that we've got to move on from Brilliant. please do yeah, in terms of the, the tax raising i absolutely agree but but also in terms of some of the spending so my um i'm on the work and pension select committee i have done a lot in social security um, we know that, uh, and it is happening al already in Manchester, about the employment support is an appropriate part of that budget to be devolved down at a local level. Other areas, but because of scale, just wouldn't be. Um, so I, I think there we need to recognise there may be bits that could be drawn out of central um, government spending and, uh, and incorporated at a, at a local level and done better, which again Manchester is, is doing. Great. Do you have any thoughts, Jen, on competitive funding pots and whether we'll actually see an end to them? I always have thoughts on competitive funding pots. Um, they are the exact opposite of everything that the levelling at white paper lays out. It's just bonkers. So <laughs> just ho hopefully that, you know, competitive funding as a premise, d you know, it's not that it doesn't have a role. Like we have had competitive funding uh, approaches one way or the other for a long time. It's not like there's absolutely no place for it. But replacing what used to be essentially local authority capital budgets with with something that uses up millions of pounds worth of public sector resources and nobody has the capacity to do at local level anyway, arguably doesn't have the capacity to administer at Whitehall level. I mean, it just doesn't, I just don't understand it really. Um, the, the other thing I was just going to mention about uh, fiscal devolution, I think that we need to talk about council tax. <laughs> um, and it's the kind of great, it's the great thing that doesn't get mentioned because it's so hard. You know, it's politically so difficult. Does anybody want to go into an election saying, hey, yeah, we're going to replace council tax with something else? Um, but we do need to talk about it. If we're going to have that conversation about how um, how places stand on their own two feet and about having a fair uh, tax system, then, then that needs to be in the mix as well.
Great. I think we have time for one or two more questions. If there's anyone else in the room who would like to ask one, the lady at the back in green. Hi, uh, I'm uh, Jackie Copley from CPRE, the Countryside Charity. We've been doing a lot of work, um, both at the national level and locally Greater Manchester, on Brownfield First, um, because levelling up does seem to basically be more greenfield coming forward in northern areas, yet the northern areas are spaces that have the nation's, you know, most brownfield sites. So there's a bit of a concern that with the levelling up reforms and the changes to planning and infrastructure and with the introduction of national development management pro policies that actually a lot of power is actually staying with central government, frustrating devolutions. I don't know if you have any comments on that because we, we, we basically think that those national development plans will act against locally derived policies. So it's, it's both in terms of where the power sits. Um, so I don't know what my question is really. But <laughs> okay. I'm making an observation, uh, but I think, uh, <laughs> okay, great, great. I think the, qu the question is, do you think the bill will be supportive of devolution? Okay, great. So that, that that's a, a question to end on in that case. If you could also roll in your your final reflections that you might have, um, preferably in about 45 seconds, if you can, Andy. Okay. Uh, well, uh, well, on on that one, I think. I mean, I think I think the the local election results kind of throw that even more up in the air. Um, I I I do think kind of um, wherever the the kind of onus on planning decisions are made, they need to be made more quickly. Um, so so you know that's that's one part of it. It doesn't really answer all of your question, but. Uh, um, I'll I'll leave it at that. I think on 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 the sort of broader broader reflections, I'm kind of conscious that I didn't try and answer the uh, the kind of left behind question, and uh, um, and I think that's really important. I mean, we've spent a lot of time talking about mayors and combined authorities, and we've spent a little bit of time talking about local authorities, and I think it's just as important to think about the capacity of institutions below combined authority level and and. Uh, um, as, as De Debbie knows better than I do, in Oldham, you know, we've spent quite a lot of time with Cash members sitting next to you. You can talk to him about it, ab about thinking about what's the relationship between a place like Oldham and Greater Manchester, um, and, and 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 you've got to get the capacity right in that respect as well. Uh, uh, and and I think g going back to kind of Debbie's point about citizens' assemblies, there's there's also quite a nice. Uh, uh, I mean, Andy's gone now, so I can pay him a compliment. Um, <laughs> Which is that when uh, I worked on the inequalities commission that he he set up, and uh, that a line that we used in that was kind of nothing about us without us, <laughs> uh, and and that and that's true spatially, um, which kind of goes back to the planning question, but it's also true about different communities kind of within uh, uh, Greater Manchester and relies on kind of panels, citizens assemblies, and that kind of input. So I think I think there is a kind of reinvention of democracy. Uh, that has to come with all of the stuff we've talked about, how you spend money, how you create institutions and how they do things. But I'll stop there. Great. Jen, some final thoughts from you? Um, yeah, I mean, I just wanted to come back to something that um, uh, uh, this, Andy, you mentioned earlier on about um, the importance of uh, stability uh, in institutions. And I think that um, there is, as the sort of... Um, the national political dynamic shifts over time. It may be that the kinds of places that we're talking about no longer have that same degree of leverage on the national debate. It may be that, you know, compared to post-Brexit, compared to the 2019 election, actually, suddenly we're no longer talking quite so much about the places that we've been talking about over the last couple of years. Um, that political bandwagon may move on, but I think the strength that um, exists within the, particularly the trailblazer deals to Greater Manchester and the West Midlands, is that um, that that starts to provide a stability of direction, and one of the reasons that we have seen the economic development that we've seen, the very visible economic development that we've seen in Manchester over the last ten years or so, was because of that sense of stability of direction, which in turn provided um, certainty to investors. And if you can at least start to embed that in Manchester and Birmingham regardless of whether at the national level the political bandwagon moves on to worry about other places, you're, you are at least 
sticking with something and it's moving. And I think for that reason, there's some reason to be um, optimistic. Excellent. And the final word to you, Debbie. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think uh, the, the conflict between sort of local uh, planning decisions and national uh, the na national policy framework, I couldn't agree with you more. We, but when we've always um, pushed around brownfield sites um, being uh, developed first, I think that's important. Um, I, I really think we are in a bit of a, um, a quandary here, li listening to the debate. Um, and I, I can see the pragmatism that, that, uh, that Jen's uh, saying, but I see so much in terms of the rhetoric from government about where they're going um, with this. I, I just don't think we can uh, let it alone. So I, I will um, be certainly pushing, continuing to push the government, but also our own side to make sure that we get, um, we recognize that devolution just isn't about, uh, and, and um, tackling regional in inequalities isn't, isn't just about setting up metro mayors. It is more than that, and it in involves all of us, and it should be a focus across departments for the national poli policies, uh, considering the impacts that they're going to have a, at a local level. But then I think, as I've tried to show, perhaps a little bit clumsy earlier on, we need to think of the inequalities within, um, for example, Man Greater Manchester. Um, in my own constituency, there's a 12-year life expectancy gap. You know, we need to recognize that and what this, this means about um, how we work collectively um, as, as agencies. And I know, unfortunately, places like Oldham have had our infrastructures hollowed out. So that means, as I say, more is having to be done with less, and that includes people coming together uh, and working in this collegiate way. So I just hope that we can recognize this it's absolutely fundamental thank you brilliant thank you debbie i think it's been a fascinating conversation that's covered a lot of ground like you jen the uh, the point andy made about institutions i think re really resonated with me the importance of having that consistency and actually as we go forward i think there's been actually quite a lot of optimism on the panel about um sort of some some steps that have been achieved particularly in greater manchester and particularly around devolution and how that needs to be used as a platform for the next stage of this agenda rather than that trends we've seen before of, of ripping it up and starting again and I think we can at least be hopeful that what the leveling up agenda has done is sort of put this this issue on the map and probably the the broad set of institutions that are in place now are the ones that are, are going to be in place for the next 10 20 years as we try and make more progress on these issues um, so thank you all for coming thank you to policy at Manchester for supporting this event this is the second of a series of four events we're doing with Policy at Manchester, two in London, two in Manchester. The next one's going to be on the 7th of June in Manchester, looking at how different levels of government can work together more effectively. Uh, we'll be advertising that soon, so do, do keep an eye out for that, and do please come along or watch online. Um, and as we close, can we all just please thank uh, my wonderful panel? <laughs>